land that I sorry about that. That that's okay. Uh let me just approve that there. <laughs> that I um, have farmed out. And uh, so I'm, I used to co-farm it and now I lease it. Um, that land, most of that land has been in my family since the late 1890s when it was first allotted to the reservation. So it has been passed down from generation to generation and I am now the caretaker of that land. Um, all the women before that were really, um, I don't know how to say it. They were married into powerful situations uh, that behooved both the tribe and the men that were marrying them. So I can trace back my direct lineage, uh, eight generations, to um, a fur trader who came from France. And mm -hmm. he, their family is considered the first family. He is considered the first family of South Dakota. So if you do any research into that, you'll find that that name, Pierre Dorian, is considered the first family of South Dakota. And he was married, or sh I should say she was married off. The Yankton Sioux tribe's daughter, Holy Rainbow, was married off to him. And uh, she and he became, because he was a trader, French uh, trader who went up and down the Missouri River, uh, they became translators. And he was part of the Lewis and Clark expedition. So if you pick up any of those books, you'll find him in there. Um, and that was from, he came over in 1780, but uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition was in 1804 that he was part of. So she was an active translator on that expedition, Holy Rainbow was. And then each of their children married other Native American women, uh, Sioux women, Yankton Sioux or, or Lakota Sioux. And uh, then their children also married uh, other women. So they were Native and then they married other Native women. Um, so in my family, the sixth generation back, I have um, the, the father was, or my great-great-grandfather was, several great greats, <laughs> um, was the first marshal of Denver. And then he ended up going up to Nebraska and then back to South Dakota and living in Spotted Tails camp. Um, my uh, Pierre Dorian, my, se my seventh great grandfather was, um, well, actually he's my fifth great grandfather. He was part of the, um, not only the Lewis and Clark expedition, but he was part of the St. Louis, the chiefs that went to St. Louis, uh, that was very famous. They gathered up a bunch of Plains Indians chiefs, and they all went to St. Louis to meet with the government. And then uh, his son, who was the, or grandson, who was the, the first marshal of Denver, also um, testified before Congress in 1871 about fraud in politics and in elections. And he was also, um, part of, he was a good friend of Roosevelt's and was invited to the White House um, several times. And he was the one that was part of Spotted Tail's camp. So even my great grand, great grandmother was one of the first um, in her family to be sent off to those boarding schools where they mm -hmm. were culturally changing the women or the children, all of the children really. Um, she went to St. Mary's boarding school and was part of that history. Um, so I have a very rich um, Native history that has always been part of my life. So art has always been part of my life because my grandmother, who lived in Winter, South Dakota, that's where my mom was born and raised, um, they did art. So she actually married a German who came over during World War, between the two wars, and he was a shoemaker by trade. And so he was making shoe uh, braces and leggings for kids with smallpox, or not smallpox, polio, sorry, mm -hmm. polio. Um, so he actually uh, did that for a while, and then he really wanted to become a farmer. So he learned the trade and started farming, and then he went to the bank, and the banks were all closed, and his money was gone during the Depression. Mm. So he ended up hitchhiking through the Midwest, trying to make money to go back and buy his farm back, his farmland back, which he did. And that's when he met my grandmother and uh, he didn't really speak a lot of English and he never even at 91 when he died was able to write English um, because they were sort of embarrassed that he was German because he'd come over during the war. So they didn't really tell anyone 
Um, and then my grandmother was embarrassed about being Native American at the time because during the you know, 40s to 70s, there were a lot of things that happened with Native Americans that um, they weren't allowed to practice their religion. They had to, they were embarrassed of who they were. So a lot of that culture uh, was broken during that time. So she and my grandfather were quite the pair. Um, as I said, she was a school teacher and he was a farmer and um, they just loved art. My my grandmother was an amazing artist and so was my mother. And I'm just lucky to have a little bit of that talent um, that, that passed down through the generations. But well, I can't remember really, a time that we weren't mm -hmm. doing art. That's fascinating. I mean, I don't think many people know that much about their families. That's really a, a rich history. So how did you wind up uh, in Arizona? Because I know you were there for a bit. Yeah, I went to TCU in Texas for college, and then I needed a transfer out of there, so I wasn't doing so well. Um, I was really, really homesick. As an only child, I missed my parents, so I uh, thought, well, I'm going to go back to school in Colorado, And but I couldn't get back into school, so um, my girlfriend was at U of A in Arizona, and I thought, okay, I'm just going to go down there and go for a semester till I get my grades back up, and uh, I ended up falling in love with uh, being at U of A, and I did very well, got straight A's at U of A, so it was the right place for me, um, and I found what I wanted to be doing, because at TCU, I was in accounting, uh, that was my major, and realized that that really wasn't for me, so I went into interior design with a, a second degree of marketing, and um, worked in the interior design field for a couple of years before I thought, that really wasn't where I wanted to be because I had moved to Chicago and was working at the first ever arts and craft store, craft store in the city of Chicago. And um, they had a bead bar and I just loved playing with beads. So that's definitely the gateway drug into metal smithing. Um, and I was doing a lot of off loom bead weaving uh, with seed beads and spending some time with Nancy Meinhardt at her house. And I just fell in love with it. And then we decided to move back to Tucson and um, there was already bead stores that were thriving. So I thought, well, what can I do? So I opened a paint it yourself pottery store. Uh, we could see almost 60 people and we had parties and school kids in and I taught them all sorts of arts and crafts. And among those arts and crafts was metal clay. I was one of the first senior teachers for art clay back in 1990, uh, 2002. I started with art clay in 1996 and became one of their first senior teachers when I worked for the Jap Japanese company. And of course, uh, metal clay is a, another gateway drug for metal smithing. And so it just morphed into metal smithing. I ended up uh, being a, a senior teacher for PMC Connection and then also Rio Grande for 10 years. So um, a total of about 15 years of being a senior teacher for metal clay. And, and then at the same time, I had a jewelry tool and supply company. So for 10 years, I owned a supply company where we had 3,800 different tools and over 100,000 inventory items. We sold everything from gold, copper, silver, and torches and all sorts of tools. So that led me to take a lot of classes. I took, um, I have now taken over 185 classes from masters everywhere. Um, learning all sorts of different skills. And that was really a blessing because I wanted to learn how to sell these tools. And in order to sell the tools, I had to know how they worked because I didn't feel like I could sell something that I hadn't tried because I wouldn't know how to help people with it. So I really just invested all of that money going back into taking classes. And so I learned a lot from how people teach and what, what how they use a tool and how they did techniques. And then I just got in my studio and started putting all of that information together. And this because was still in I, Chicago? And this was still in Chicago or had you already moved by no, then? I had already been back to Arizona. So I moved back to Arizona 35 years ago. So okay. just after we had our kid in Chicago, we moved back because free babysitting. <laughs> uh, both grandparents were there. So we decided that was the best move for our kid was to have um, family around. So we left Chicago and went back to Arizona. And, and where so, did you start the Jewelry Makers Guild? Oh, I started that in Arizona about five years ago or four years ago, right oh, before see. COVID. Okay. So that was, look, that's pretty recent. All right. And the move to Montana is as well. Is that correct? 
Yeah, we moved to Montana uh, part-time seven years ago because our son played football for the University of Montana, and we wanted to be close to support him through that endeavor. You know, once you're a football mom, you're a football mom until they quit. So that was really important for us not to miss any games and to also because he transferred in the middle of his college career, um, it's really hard to come into a new place mm -hmm. and be the new guy and be starting. So uh, we decided we wanted to be here to help him. And we just found the perfect property on the river and fell in love and decided to build a house. So we split our time now between Montana and Arizona, um, about six months in each place. Uh, but we're getting ready to probably sell our house in Arizona and be in Montana full time. Well, Missoula is beautiful. Oh, it's so lovely. <laughs> it really is. So who would you say are your artistic influences? Oh, so many. It's really hard to nail those down. Um, I would say, uh, let's see, I, I am a huge uh, follower of Harold's. Uh, I've taken about five weeks of his classes. I've known him since 2007 when I took my first master's class from him at Revere Academy. Um, I have so many other teachers like Pat Flynn, who is amazing. I've taken a lot of his classes. Uh, Michael Boyd, I've taken probably five or six weeks with him um, on lapidary and gold applications. Um, so those, I, you know, I'm really, uh, a sh my shiro is Judith Kinghorn. I absolutely love her work. And she is just a wonderful human being, uh, really just so lovely. Um, I've met her a couple of times in person, but always been kind of afraid to talk to her. So more from at a distance. Um, but oh, there are so many people who influence my work, uh, even painting, painters. Um, I love Japanese art. Um, so I find a huge connection to that. And also to Native American art. I spend a lot of time going to museums and taking lots of pictures um, of the detail and trying to find a way to thread that into my work, um, whether it's the history or the place or uh, a time that something that happened or a story from one of their stories that they tell, I try to weave that into the work, but nature really influences me more than anything. Just being here um, by the river, um, trees, hiking, all of the things that you have here also are a huge influence in what I see and what I try to uh, tell it through the stories of my work. Now, the class that you're going to be teaching this time is going to be the Art of Affordable Gold. Yes. Can, can you tell, and I don't know how many of the current participants are registered in, in that class. I suspect a few are at least. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what that's going to entail without going into too much detail as to the actual technique? Sure. So uh, my impetus for the class was that there are so many different techniques that you can do that allow you to add gold affordably to your work. Um, I think it's a huge jump for most metalsmiths who aren't working as a bench jeweler to take that leap with gold, because first of all, the cost is somewhat prohibitive at times to think about putting in, you know, even a $60 bezel into your work, and then you have to double that and then double that again, that starts adding up to your the price of what you want to sell your piece. But what most people don't understand is that by adding gold or diamonds or high end stones, it gives a perception of value to your work that you can't get otherwise. There are a lot of people that will buy high-end jewelry if it's mixed metal because they like the look of silver or platinum. And actually platinum's really not very expensive anymore compared to gold, it's come way down. So learning how to integrate metals together um, gives you the best of both worlds. So if somebody likes to wear gold, but they really don't wanna spend thousands of dollars on a piece, they can get the look or the coloring of gold by adding it to the metal, the silver metal and getting more stretching your, your buck a little bit. Um, and the techniques for these things aren't very, aren't difficult. Um, they do take uh, practice. So it, every, the students that I've had so far um, have had great luck with it. It does take practice and some confidence because getting past that initial fear of working with gold, oh my gosh, this is $300, oh, this is $150. 
and looking past that and being willing to try it. Um, the results have been magnificent. The pieces that they have made um, are really great. And so having that, uh, seeing that come to fruition um, and encouraging them to try something new has been really rewarding. And I love being able to add it to my work because it just, the value of adding it to the work and being able to price it higher and have it perceived as a demi, you know, demi precious uh, category um, over costume jewelry or regular silver jewelry takes it to that next level that I wouldn't be able to do if it was just silver, even with granulation, which is usually considered a higher end technique it's still hard to sell it, um, the labor of it on silver if you don't have any gold added. So adding a little bit of gold really pays off. So the class um, covers this, the affordable gold class is an abbreviated form of the regular class that I teach online because that one really was about 26 hours of demos. So this is going to be a shortened version of it, but we're definitely going to be making bimetal. So for example, here I'll just take this ring and take this one off. So uh, this, for example, is the top is bimetal and then the band has both uh, painted gold that's fused to the surface, especially in the recesses. And then it's also got a little bit of kombu on it in the recesses. So I'm very careful about how I add gold so that it's not going to wear off. Um, and I also am considering how much, how thick it is and where it's being placed, which that's part of the class is learning um, with how to, what to consider when you're going to apply gold, how you would consider the different applications. And it's like um, hammers, you know, you wouldn't take a two pound hammer to do stamping work, you know, to, or to do chasing a repose work. You would use a two pound hammer on a stamp. So the same thing happens with gold and with also with torches. It's knowing what torch to use, what mix of gas, what flame to use to achieve whatever goal you have. Uh, same thing with what type of application of gold do I use? Do I use bimetal, which is a, the thickest? Do I use handmade kombu? Do I use regular commercial kombu? Do I paint on fusible gold? Do I have it plated? Do I buy clad gold, which is you know where, where you can buy it, where it's gold on the outside and a different metal on the inside? So it's like gold filled. So it's just kind of deciding how you're going to apply those different techniques and then, um, and also weighing the idea of the cost. Okay, so what can I charge for a piece like this? Um, what level of price point am I after? Okay, then I probably can't use this technique, but I can use this technique. So we talk about that in class as well. So this one is also bimetal, bimetal, bimetal. Uh, and then there's a stone set and it's silver. And then the clasp is also uh, bimetal. And then this is uh, the paint on gold technique. And this is the bimetal technique. And then these are uh, gold granules that are applied to the bar. Um, so this is a piece of the bimetal. So just taking this tiny piece, this disc. So if I have these sheets of metal and I've made this material ahead of time, I have a bunch of things to choose from, sort of like canvases or paint on a canvas. And I can then take a small piece and punch out a circle and dome it and shape it and add it to a piece. And now I have increased the value. Um, and this is, is bimetal, so it is, a thick layer of gold that has been fused to the surface of sterling and rolled down. So when we're making it, it looks like this. Let me grab my little pieces. So first we make an ingot or a little ball, if you will. This one's been hammered, but you can see that's 24 karat. And then we roll it out thin, so I show you how to do that. And then we fuse it to a piece of thick sterling silver. And then we do some design work to it. 
and we end up rolling it out further into the thickness of the metal that we want to use. So if I'm doing a ring, which is, this is a ring, uh, well, what's missing is the top to a ring, that was rolled out to 20 gauge. This one has been rolled out to 24 gauge because, and it's been patina just so you can see the patterning. Um, this one is rolled out to 20 gauge as well, and it can be rolled out further. This is original one that's on 14 gauge, so you can see the mm -hmm. thickness of the metal. And what happens is this was actually, this piece was actually this size. It was the other half of this piece of metal. So you can see that you can really grow, and this was, um, where's my little ingot? I've already lost my ingot, but it was this size. This one is actually 18 karat fusing gold, but it was this size when I started and I ended up getting a piece this big out of it. And then when I rolled it down, I got a piece this big out of 20 gauge. So it really goes a lot further than you think. You get quite a bit out of this. And then whatever I have left over, I continue to use for other pieces. Like I'll cut little discs out, I'll cut little pieces out and so on. So, um, Learning how to use the metal and how to alloy the metal is really a lot of fun. It seems scary at first, but what I do is I demystify the process of alloying. Um, I have these sheets that I made. These are mine, copyrighted by me, that they're only given to my students, um, that I take you through a color-coded process of how to make your own alloys. And we actually alloy, um, we first make our bimetal with 24 karat, and then I show you how to alloy 18 karat fusing gold. So you can get into doing, making all sorts of things with whatever color suits your, um, your, your desire, your coloring of whatever you're trying to match. And then we also talk about um, how to apply the gold that is the liquid gold. So- And at the, you'll be covering this uh, at, the, uh, at the MAG workshop? Yes. Oh, great. Yep. Um, so for example, this one is kombu and this one is the painted um, fusible gold. So I, I will show you both those techniques of how to, so it just depends on what your, what your look is, what you're after. Do you want a pattern? Because you can also cut kombu out with punches and uh, scissors and all sorts of things. So I'll take you through the process of that and how to apply it both with torch and with a hot plate or heat pad or a trinket kiln. Um, so we'll go over that. We'll talk about how to apply it to a piece after also. So these are both after processes. So if I decide later I wanna add gold, I could either choose kombu or I can choose fused paintable gold, which is what this is, which is also applied with a torch, a basic butane torch works great. This is the bimetal. These two discs have bimetal on it. So also picking up and using the bimetal in a different way. So you, you know, you could get lots and lots of this size shapes out of the piece of gold that we're making to add to any of your pieces later. Um, this one is the uh, painted on gold, I think. Yeah, this is the painted on gold and then it's been engraved through it. Um, this is painted on also. It's probably one of my favorite ways of applying gold and it's so easy and cost-effective. Um, this is a piece of bimetal on there. Um, the clasp, this is also painted on gold, and the clasp is uh, painted on and kombu together. And then, um, let's see, even things like this, where you're using a gold bezel, um, I taught the last class how to use the bimetal as a bezel. So now you're even taking the cost from $60 down to like $30 or $20 for a gold bezel by using bimetal. And then mm -hmm. the cross, which is just a 3D component that's been pressed, that has gold on it. So that was painted on gold afterwards and then granulation. So um, being able to pick and choose where you want to add your gold um, this one is got, uh, the prongs are, are 22 karat gold, but the rest of it is all bimetal scraps and kombu scraps. So in textured scraps from, and this is all fused together in the round, but which I won't be covering in this class. That was the last class that I did for MAG. Um, but there's 
gold all over this piece, either through a var variety of techniques, whether it was, but it's all scraps, things that I had left over that I applied to the piece. The kombu, of course, is not, and the paint, it's not, but all of the bimetal is um, a, all scraps. So being able to use everything you have left over from that piece that uh, you want to add back into your work. And then, you know, you can pick up coloring of gold by using um, gold tubing to add to the gold. So this is a spinner ring that has gold that has been applied uh, and fused to the surface of the spinner band. And then I have some gold granules on the fuse band along with the tubing. So we'll be talking a bunch, about a bunch of different techniques and applications, but the thing we're focusing on this class is creating the bimetal and how to create the designs in it, how to alloy and how to get over your sort of your fear or your reluctance to use gold and showing you that, you know, if you have these little three ingredients in your cupboard, you can pretty much make anything and you can make your own uh, silver, you know, you recycle your silver because once you get a few uh, techniques under your belt with, so this is just recycled silver, hasn't been pickled yet, but this I just used as a demo when I was showing them how to melt it down and roll it back out using the same techniques. So you can get really uh, freed up with your recycled materials and also using small amounts of gold to create work that elevates um, your work into something new and different. So I've got some gold balls that are soldered onto here. This is gold that's been fused into sterling silver and then granulated around it. There's some gold uh, granules in here, granulation on reticulated metal, some cast pieces um, that's water casting, and then mm -hmm. just some shot balls and some work that's been done with the burrs. Um, to create interesting work that expresses your voice and your um, story that you're trying to tell. Wow, that's really great. I think like everybody else, I'm a little speechless. <laughs> that's really <laughs> wonderful. Um, do you want to entertain any questions at this point or is there anything? Absolutely. Okay. Um, if anybody has questions, please go ahead and unmute yourself and just go ahead and ask a question. Participate in the conversation here. Anyone? We have 50 some people, 50 people participating. So I know somebody's bound to have a question. So um, Nell, someone's asked if this if the class is full. There's uh, one spot left. One spot? That's the answer. One class is left. One, one, one slot. Yes, and we have a Facebook group. So the Facebook group, you guys have access to me for six months. And uh, so that's a great place to watch the videos after class, ask questions about things, problems you have in your studio, things that have happened while you were trying the technique after class, in case you didn't get to it during class. I want to have a way for you guys to have an open door communication with me so that down the road, when you forget step number six on the bimetal, you can just type it into the group and you'll get an answer. So we have a Facebook group that's pretty vibrant. Even the one from last year stayed pretty vibrant until about February, March of this year. So I was really surprised it went for about nine months. Um, and so that's really great because that means people are still trying techniques from that class and I'm still available to help you. Um, so that that comes with the class. We've already started that. Uh, the, there will be a tool class that's a two to three hour bonus class. It's happening this Tuesday. We're going to go over torches, different kinds of torches, how to mix the fuel, how to get the right flame, what kind of surface to use, because not every surface is is the right surface to use. And when you're soldering or when you're setting up your solder or when you're fusing or when you're even making an ingot. So we'll go over surfaces. We're gonna go over all the tools I use in my fabrication bench um, so that you can see what I'm using and you'll know where to get it from. So we go over tools and supplies also during that bonus class. And then on the 7th and 8th, which is Saturday and Sunday, it's an all day class. So there'll be demo, you work, you can ask me questions, 
demo, repeat, rinse and repeat. And then you have the six months on the, you'll have 30 days to watch the videos and six months to ask me questions. And I talk to you about how to make recipe cards so that you'll remember the steps. So you have the recipe, so you'll have success down the road because maybe something happens. You have to take care of a sick parent. You have something that happens in your life. You're going through a move. I wanna have a way that when you pick it back up again, and you don't remember those steps that you have, you can reach out to me as your teacher, as your mentor, and ask me those questions so that we can, you can fill in that gap. So okay. and Tanya, is this for anybody that's a member of your Facebook group or just people that have enrolled in your class? Yes, just people that are in the class. So there is a Facebook group just for this class, for the Art okay. of Affordable Gold. So, so you create a Facebook group per class? Yes, for every okay. class. And it's because I think it. Community is so off. important. Yes. Okay. So I think it, community is so important. And that's why we love to take classes in person because we can meet other people, we can talk. And I think you'll find with all my past students, which a lot of them are here tonight in the, the sip and saw um, that I, our recent students, they will uh, find new people to be friends with. And they uh, have great communication back and forth in, in that group and answer each, each other's questions. So I think we can find a way to have community with online classes that also are part of the joy of being in the class. Well, Mary, unfortunately, found out that the class is full. We did put the link up there. So uh, somebody beat her to it. Oh, no. Uh, I'm wondering, <laughs> if is, it, is it Alex? <laughs> it was a race for that last slot. <laughs> well, I'm glad it's full, but it'll be repeated again. So you can look for it another time. Mm -hmm. It says, will you be offering this class again? Yes. Oh, Alex didn't get it. Sorry? Yes. In 2024, it will be repeated again. And I think even the art of the chain that we did last year will be offered again. So I've had some students that want to retake it. So we'll see. There, there's a lot of information in the classes. So I have a lot of students that take them again. Well, I'm sure one of the benefits of, of basically doing a class at, at MAG is that there is a live component so that people can actually meet you in person and see you and talk to you and interact with you over a period of, you know, several days. So that is one good thing about the live class that uh, you're going to be doing for, for us as opposed to the video class. It's wonderful that you're so available, but it's always great to see you in person, I'm sure. Yes. Yes. Someday I'd like to get to Georgia. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Francesca says, I can attest to the volume of information she offers. It's a lot. And you will for sure want to take class more often than once. Okay? <laughs> you have a very loyal following and, and massive. I do. Too. That's great. Do. Any other Thank questions? Hmm. Uh, now, someone's asking what skill level is needed for this class. What skill level would you recommend? I would, I would say you need to be a advanced beginner or intermediate because um, you have to have confidence with the torch. Now, you don't have to know everything about the torch because I'm going to show you a lot about the torches and the flame and the gas and the mixing because I think that's where the success is. I'm very big on the why behind the what. And so I go into depth about what's happening with the metal, how we have to work in a hierarchy of steps so that we're always thinking about, we need to do this first before we can do this, before we can do this. And so when you start to think that way and you start breaking down your flame and your mix and your solder, uh, your surfaces, you're able to understand what's happening so much easier. So then you can be more innovative when you sit down to make things. So, um, these are things that we talk about in class because I, I think that's where the growth comes from. And that's where it, and it gives you the confidence to go out and try it because then you understand a little bit more about what, what is happening. She took down a bottle of water. Was it? Any other questions or comments? I really appreciate you guys coming tonight and taking your, your very valuable time to come to this. I, I wish that I we were all in a room so I could talk to you afterwards. 
Um, but feel free to send me questions or to reach out to me if you have any specific questions later that you think about. Um, Cause I always think of questions I wish I had asked like two hours afterwards or when I'm driving home or whatever. So uh, don't be a stranger and don't feel like you cannot reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to help. Or if you have a suggestion for a class that you would like to take or learn about, um, approach MAG and let them know, or you can come to me and let me know. I would be happy to uh, entertain those ideas as well, which I think is how this class came about. So um, I'm always happy to teach for MAG and I, I hope you all will continue to support them so that they can serve this very uh, necessary and special need in the community. We have to keep these schools open and have a vibrant community going. We can't just always be alone in our studios or do online classes. So I'm grateful that they're there and uh, I feel very appreciative that they have asked me to come back again and teach this year. Tanya, I have a question. <clears throat> what, is, what is your, um, I saw online the other day on your website that you're going to be teaching a hinges class. Yep, my next class, which uh, will be start signups in November and it's in January, is called Hinges and Hollows, the Art of Memora, uh, Memento Mori. And so we're going to be creating hollow forms that have uh, texture. And we're going to, uh, these forms will be so that you could add ashes or fabric or hair or something from a loved one or a pet or an animal or just make something that's special for you. Maybe these are words or a Psalm you want to write down and put inside. And I'm gonna show you how to make a threaded um, capture so that or a threaded entry into that hollow form and also how to do a plug and a solder, a hollow form shut. So there'll be three ways that we make take this hollow form and make it into a capsule so that you can then take that threading uh, concept and use it in other projects. I do a lot of th tap and die threaded projects. And then there's going to be a hinge on it, which connects to another part that has a stone setting on it. So these classes um, that generally online are very intensive. They're five to six sessions long, usually when I'm not doing a two day class. So it's just a little bit longer and more in depth. So uh, when you're doing a two day class, it's a little bit hard to have work time that is sufficient in between the demos, but we make it work with MAG. So it, you know, last year they all did the uh, 30 inch chain with a clasp and we did it in two days. So they may not have finished their projects, but they all went through the process. Um, so it's fun to teach these kinds of things that have a multitude of techniques in them. And I think as long as you have the confidence to use a torch as an intermediate beginner, or an advanced beginner, you can learn easily the rest of the concepts to grow your skill base. And I'm still working on my chain. It's like it's like my lifelong <laughs> project. We got interrupted by a hurricane, but uh, each one of those little links is a separate little work of art. They're just they're, it is. I love doing that. Thank yes. you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Don't be shy. Hey, Nell. Yes. Can we plug our online silent auction that's coming up? Yes. Oh, please go ahead. So we're having our 25th anniversary this year for MAG. Wow. Um, we've actually been in existence 25 years and yep. we are busting at the seams and we are going to be moving in 2024 because we need more space, more studios, more people are coming and um, we're designating an online si silent auction that's going to be at our jewelry show on October the 20, 20th. And the online silent auction will feature um, some of the artists that are in the show, as well as some national artists that we ask if they would um, help us out by supplying a piece. So we're hoping in the next uh, week to two, we will be putting that online. Sabrina is in our... Um, class and she's the uh, artist assistant for Tanya for this class and Sabrina is a technological guru and um, she's working on the silent auction it's going to be virtual so anyone in the world can bid on the pieces that you see and we have some pretty amazing pieces that um, we start out at 30 percent of their retail value and then people bid them up we also have tools that have been donated by Lindstrom 
and um, Chris at, at Lion Ford Punch. I'll say that backwards each time. Lion Punch Forge. Um, we have Cool Tools has, has given um, a gift certificate. We have Craft Optics that you can bid on. So we have a whole plethora of um, trips where you can take a trip anywhere wow. where you can literally sort of travel for the cause and buy a trip for a family of six or, you know, a trip to New York and go to Brooklyn and go to the different um, studios of all the Brooklyn, hot Brooklyn artists. So we have seven different trips that you possibly could win. Wow. And we just have a lot of really fun things happening. Every single penny that comes from the silent auction will go towards Mag's move, which as wow. Francesca, if she's still on here, knows moving mm -hmm. is huge. So we're hoping that the silent auction can really make a difference to make it um, um, a much easier transition for us to a new bigger space. Do you already have the space? Sorry? Not yet. Not no, yet. not yet. We're looking. <laughs> There's Janet. That Janet is our president. Janet is um, on the call, and um, she has kind of been heading up looking for space. And it's not easy, just to let you know. Um, we've had somebody looking, and I think something like 66 different spaces they looked at, and only one out of 66 spaces liked our torches. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is a problem. So that's a problem. So we are um, really trying to think outside the box as to how we get a new space because we want to include spaces for individual artists and have kind mm -hmm. of an emerging artist community. Um, and we need more studios because we have lots of people coming in, but we also want to have open studio where people can come in and be working all the time and use that as a resource. So we have a, have a lot of things on the plate that we're looking at. Sounds amazing. Well, if anybody out there knows about a commercial space in Metro Atlanta, let us know. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I just want to let everyone know that this organization is run completely by volunteers. And it's it's a just a huge amount of work. I can't even tell you how much time everyone on this board puts into keeping this place running. It's 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 more than a full time job. So um, just really lucky to have this amazing group of, of volunteers that make yeah, it all happen. I would, I would like to personally say that we're so grateful to Janet and for Joan because they do an enormous amount. And my That's... hair used to be black. You'll notice <laughs> it's really great. <laughs> After joining Meg. No, I'm just kidding. I've been grateful. Well... Anybody have any other questions? But anyway, I'm pretty excited about the silent auction. You know, I'm at least going to try to bid on a Harold O'Connor piece. I'm yes, sure we have it. three pieces from Harold O'Connor, all of which are to die for. They are. Just to freaking so, die for. We, yeah. We're putting it in the gym light box. I don't know if you can see the gym light box back on my table because I brought it home to photograph all the pieces. And we put it in the light box and it was like, oh my God, it's amazing. <laughs> Granulated. Tanya, you would die for it. So I got one of his uh, pieces at uh, Coma. It was yeah. an auction piece, and it was it's a ring that I bid on and won. So yeah, his pieces are amazing. He, he is an amazing man. Okay. Any other questions? We have a little bit of time left. Comments? Well, you guys are really quiet. All I got to do is, you know, when I'm in class with some people, it's not nearly this quiet. <laughs> All right. Is there anything else you'd like to say, Tanya? Nope. I'm just very grateful for all the opportunities to teach at MAG and uh, to connect with students who want to learn these techniques, um, whether it's granulation or reticulation or, or gold um, or fusing. So there's so much to do and so many techniques that you can add to your voice that helps you communicate your story of your piece of what you're trying to say. And I think that's the hardest thing is deciding what your voice is. But once you determine that and find a technique that you really love, I think it's easy after that it just flows through you once you invite that into your um, soul and into yourself that you can then make work and take classes, always take classes, because 
even if it's something you already know how to do, you might learn something from the teacher about how they do it that makes it more efficient, makes it more fun. That one tool that they show you that makes your life that much easier. I am a tool junkie. So I believe, and having sold tools, I have a, a, a an affair with them, but, um, and there are tools I think that just make your life so much easier and so much more fun. So knowing how to use them, um, only comes from taking classes. You know, you, you really don't know about a tool until somebody shows it to you. So having mag there to be able to go take a class is amazing. I just recently took an on, I was an online participator at the uh, class with Ryan and uh, because he said he was teaching some new stuff and I had already taken a bunch of classes from him with Michael when he assisted with Michael, but I learned new things. So every time you take a class, because you're only ready for what you're ready for, there are things that you're not ready for yet. So they just kind of go past you and that's okay. And then when you take the class again, you're ready for new things. And that's when the magic happens. So I, I encourage people to always look at all the classes that you guys offer, whether it's online or in person and try it. Well, you can never know it all. You know, and I mean, in my former life, I was a lawyer and they call it the practice of law because you never perfect it. And right. Yeah. Metal smithing is pretty much the same way, you know, exactly. You keep learning and keep modifying and keep changing. Yep. It's funny because I, people say, you know, are you a master? And I said, no, I'm not a master at anything. I, I hope I never am because that means that you've stopped learning, that you can't improve, that you don't know you, there's nothing for left for you to learn. And I will always be a student. I will always have some place to learn or to add or, or to try and master something else. But, um, and then when someone says they're a master, I, I think, well, what are they a master of? Because you can't be, like you said, a master of everything. There are things that you can really hone in and you're a master of that thing, but there's always something new to learn from somebody else. And even in students in community, you can learn from other students taking in the class, which I love meeting other students when I'm a student, because there's so much sharing that goes on amongst the students and you can watch what they do or hear what they say. And then you learn something from that. So I encourage people to take classes. All right, I think we've got time for maybe one or two more comments or questions. Okay. Well, Tanya, thank you so very much for joining us tonight and for showing us what you're going to be teaching and giving us an insight into your inspirations and really getting everybody very excited about what they're going to learn in your class. Thank you very um, much. If thank no you for has- inviting me. I really sure. appreciate it. Sure. Thanks, Tanya. Really. Thanks hand. for Thank coming, you. everybody. Thank you. No, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I guess I, at this point, I'm just going to end it for everyone, unless anyone has anything else to say. All right. Good night. Thank you so much. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.